Hello and welcome to The Public Square, a show that explores public affairs and religious liberty issues that affect our nation and beyond. I'm your host, Paul Goodridge, and I'm the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Director for the South Central Conference of Seventh-day Adventists located in Nashville, Tennessee. In each episode, we'll talk to people who are on the front lines of the fight for civil and religious liberty. My goal is to inform about issues that directly and indirectly have an impact on everyday life, ignite meaningful thought and reflection, inspire my audience to action, and integrate faith principles in how we relate to others. Today, we're going to talk about the various ways that voting rights are under attack. We'll talk about the history of voter suppression and what we can do to protect the right to vote. In this general election year, it's more important than ever that those who are eligible to vote are given the opportunity to vote. But before we get into the program, I want to invite you to subscribe to our program, to uh, press the like button, and to share this with others as we grow our audience and as we continue to share information that we hope is meaningful to you. We want you to be able to share it with others. So again, thank you for joining us and let's meet in the public square. Well, I want to invite our guests to join us. We have three guests. I'm excited about them. They are experts in their field. And so I'm going to uh, begin with Bernard Simulton. Bernard is the president of the Alabama Conference of the NAACP. Uh, he served in the United States Air Force and retired as a lieutenant colonel. In addition to be, being a member of the NAACP, he serves on the board of directors of the Alabama Coalition for Immigrant Justice. And he's also served as past president of the board of directors of the Community Action Partnership for Huntsville, Madison, and Limestone Counties. Uh, Bernard Simulton, welcome to the public square. Thank you. All right. Next, we have uh, Angela Curry, who is the founder and executive director of United Women of Color, a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering girls, women, and their communities. She also serves on the board of directors for Alabama Forward and Huntsville Bail Fund. And she believes in the power of civic engagement and is committed to human rights and positive social change. Angela Curry, welcome to the public square. Thank you, good evening. And finally, we have Preston Foster, who is an assistant professor and program director of public policy at Oakwood University. He is a man, a multifaceted man. He's a public affairs executive, an entrepreneur, an education reform consultant, a change agent, an author, an essayist, and communications consultant. He formerly served as deputy assistant secretary and White House fellow for the United States Department of Education and is the co-founder and president of Sage Products, LLC, an international hair care products company. Uh, <laughs> Preston Foster, welcome to the public square. Yes, good, Rich. It's always good to be with you. And Ms. Curry and Mr. Simulton, it's great to be with you. So I want to begin with a video clip, and it's actually one from uh, PBS, uh, from a program called uh, Pre Preserving Democracy, that I believe kind of crystallizes uh, what this show is about and, and the <clears throat> issues that we face when it comes to um, voting and voting rights and voter suppression. So I, I, I'm, we're going to play this quick clip, and then I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, respond or react to the video. Voting has always been contested in this country, and that is because it is such a powerful tool of accountability. It is the currency that we all have. It is the way in which we can all be equal, despite any status that we might hold in any other realm. One person, one vote, at least theoretically, 
It is the way that we all have a voice in our democracy. And so voting has been contested from the very founding of this country. Those who were poor, those who were dispossessed, women, anyone who was not considered white could not vote. And our country never intended for those individuals to be included. It took struggle and contestation and protest and even violence to ensure that we could have a more inclusive democracy. And that is because the vote is so very powerful. It is the most significant means of accountability that is nonviolent and that allows everyone to participate on an equal basis. So, panel, as we approach the 2024 general election between incumbent President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump, the stakes for the country could not be higher. And I wanted to kind of get your reaction and response to uh, the video um, suggesting that the single most powerful tool that citizens of the United States have is the right to vote and the potential attacks on that right. And so, um, Angela, I'll begin with you. Um, as not only a woman, but a woman of color, um, mm -hmm. how do you resonate with this idea of the right to vote being under attack? Well, as the uh, video stated, it is an equalizer. So um, we often assist with getting out the vote with elections um, where there's a great disparity between like the two different candidates and their money but and i tell people all the time it doesn't matter how much money you have your vote is just as equal to the richest individual in this in this country so um and and women are paying attention because we are being targeted uh in many ways so I feel that is very our votes are very valuable um there's a certain sector of people who understand how valuable they are, and that is why they have been working for decades to restrict our right to vote. Mm. Mm. Uh, Bernard, um, what, what are your um, perspective on this issue? Uh, <clears throat> I agree with uh, Angela, and I agree with, uh, I think that was Janae Nelson, LDF, but the right to vote is so it's, it's fundamental, but it's something that we do not take seriously in some of our uh, communities. And so the right to vote, it was not given to African-Americans. And still today, we have to struggle because there are so many things that are uh, uh, so many opportunities, uh, so many things they are trying to do to suppress our vote we have to struggle to maintain our right to vote. And so it is essential that those who care about themselves, those who care about their community, those who care about their family, you must take voting seriously and make it a top priority for you. And that does not mean you just go on election day and vote for whomever's on the ballot. That means you get involved prior to that, become informed, become educated on the issues and what position do the candidates take on those issues. I'm, I don't care if you're running for dog catcher. You know, you want the person that's going to be the dog catcher in your community to be the best dog catcher, to treat the dogs fairly or to get them mm -hmm. off the street or whatever it is. We must take voting seriously and we must make sure that we go to the polls on election day and do what our civic duty calls for us to do, and that is to cast our vote for the person of our choice. Okay, so so let, you, you kind of talked about being informed. So let's kind of step back a little bit and maybe back a little bit in time. And uh, Preston, I'm going to um, press upon you as our resident educator. Uh, kind of give us a little bit of the background to this issue of voting rights and the fact that um, we haven't always um, 
you know, had the opportunity to vote as, you know, African Americans mm -hmm. or women, etc. So kind of give us a little bit of background in terms of the history of voting rights. Well, this could be a whole class in itself. But I'll, <laughs> I'll try to do it some justice. Um, after the Civil War and during the Reconstruction, it was the first time that Blacks were given the franchise to vote. And as Ms. Nelson said during the, the video, um, voting is the currency of democracy. It is what we use to equalize um, ourselves in this country, and it's how we represent ourselves. But 12 years after the Civil War ended, the Reconstruction ended, and Jim Crow was awakened in 1877. And from that time, particularly in the South, but also in the North and, and in the Northwest, Blacks were disenfranchised of their right to vote. Uh, we'll fast forward to the, the 1950s, the 1940s, the 1950s, where there were poll taxes and literacy tests and um, other <clears throat> obstacles to voting. And in 1965, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, protecting the right for African-Americans to vote in this country. And notably, in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there was a clause in Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act called preclearance. And what preclearance did was it uh, made states and counties that had a history of discriminating against the voting rights of Blacks, it made them have to preclear with the federal government, with the Justice Department, any changes to voting access, voting, um, uh, voting re voter registration, uh, voting locations, anything that changed at all had to be pre-cleared with the federal government. Um, and that stayed in, in place and was renewed eight times prior to 2020, excuse me, prior to 2013. Mm -hmm. Then in 2013, the US Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, meaning that um, these states and these localities no longer had to get permission, if you will, from the federal government to change anything. And if you read um, their thinking, uh, the, Supreme, the Supreme Court's thinking, they basically said, and I'm paraphrasing um, Chief Justice Thomas, that basically uh, racism was over. Uh, we, have a, we had a black president, Barack Obama was president at the time, and they saw no more need. They said it's been 50 years since the Voting Rights Act was passed, and they saw no need to pre-clear those states. And since that time, and I could stay on this forever, but since that mm -hmm. time, those same states have put in place the same kind of hindrances that caused them to have to pre-clear. Um, you better cut me off here because I'll, I'll just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I appreciate it, I appreciate it. So, so, you, so you're, you're talking about the Voting Rights Act, which was put in place to, um, um, you know, uh, counter the Jim Crow laws that were uh, set to limit the right to vote. Uh, Bernard, I, I believe I uh, noticed in your bio, I think you were born and raised in Mississippi. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so um, maybe from either firsthand knowledge or maybe, you know, family or, or around you, but what were, and, and I, I know that you had mentioned some of it in terms of uh, Preston, but what were some of the um, tactics and tools that hindered the right to vote that, that uh, brought about the need for um, the um, Voting Rights Act of 1965? 
Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that opportunity. But let me go back to, you know, the uh, Constitution of the United States, the uh, 14th, 15th Amendment to the Constitution, you know, that gave us the uh, gave citizens the right to vote. And, you know, under those uh, amendments to the Constitution, you know, it should not have been a need for a Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and all these different acts. Mm -hmm. But because states try to prevent uh, certain people from voting, particular people of color, blacks in particular, from voting, you know, they had to come up with uh, the Civil Rights Act and, of course, the landmark decision, the Voting Rights Act, the 65, to ensure that blacks were protected and that when they had the right to vote. Now, growing up in Mississippi, you know, I remember my parents talking about, and again, I didn't quite understand at that particular time, but I remember them telling us, uh, saying that, you know, I got to go pay my poll taxes. And, you know, I didn't know what poll taxes were at that time, and I just mm. thought it was something that, you know, they had to do, but not knowing. And I, I just wished I had known, and I was young, so I mean, I was probably around 12, 13. I, it, it just really irks me now that I remember them talking about having to go to pay a poll tax in order to do something that's guaranteed to you by the Constitution of the United States of America. And <clears throat> let, let me just okay. let me let me just stop you there for a second. Um, can you just explain for those who don't know, uh, who may be watching, especially outside of the United States, what what is exactly it was the poll tax? The poll taxes was. Uh, in order to vote, you had to pay. It, it was a, a tax a fee that you had to pay in order to be a registered voter. You had to go and pay your poll taxes, you know, just like you did your property tax or any other tax. In order for a person to vote, mm -hmm. you had to have paid your poll taxes. And of course, before that, you know, they had all kind of laws that you had on land and all things like that. But it was a provision that were put in place to eliminate blacks from voting, just like the literacy test, you know, trying to tell how many uh, bubbles are in a bar of soap or how many jelly beans are mm -hmm. in a jar in which no one got right, except, you know, uh, some clerk up there may have said, well, okay, you got it right and let some blacks vote. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, you know, you didn't get the answer right because nobody knew that really knew the answer, but yeah, uh, it was a method to prevent blacks from being able to vote. And they know blacks, some blacks didn't have money. And when you were trying to feed a family and you have money to pay, to feed your family or to go po uh, pay your poll taxes, you know, um, mm -hmm. my parents weren't rich. And so, you know, I mean, they had the money to pay the poll taxes, but there are a lot of people didn't, didn't have the money to pay the poll taxes. And so they fed their family and forego mm -hmm. their right to vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, um... that's, that's, that's my experience yeah yeah um angela you know um i know there are a number of other um attempts to uh suppress the vote um and so this idea of redlining and redistricting um i know that's that's one of them <clears throat> gerrymandering can you just explain to our audience what some of those things uh were and kind of still happening now I Yes, uh, I was going to say it's still happening to this day, uh, especially in Alabama. So uh, there was a lawsuit filed here. Uh, what was it? Allen versus uh, Milligan, where we had to sue because of the, the plaintiff sued because the lines were being drawn for congressional districts that were not in the best interest of uh, black Alabamians. And so we have now received a seat uh, that is still being contested to where uh, it, the potential for a black representative could actually be elected in South Alabama for Congress. But mm -hmm. the gerrymandering is literally the elected officials of our cities, our counties, and our state drawing lines that create the districts for which we vote based on geographics. And they're to take into account the diversity of each of those locales, whether it be city or state, 
uh, or county. However, uh, for lack of a better word, other than suppression, they, they draw the lines in a way that will concentrate a group of Black neighborhoods together so that those Blacks will only elect a Black individual, but those Blacks won't have enough uh, impact on an election uh, in another district where they could uh, more evenly disperse the Black vote. Uh, and so we've seen that happen in our city and our county uh, across the state. And so without legal challenges, this happens once every 10 years, we are uh, relegated to those district lines until the next census, because the census population determines our uh, how they that determines how they should draw the lines and what the representation could be. Now, anybody can answer this, but how is this allowed to happen? How how is this fair? How is this legal? How is this possible? Well, uh, and I like to jump in on that and say how it would happen. It's all because the people who were elected to those offices that draw those lines. And if we don't get out and vote, then this is what we're going to get. People drawing lines to their own benefit and not to benefit people of color in particular, again, Afri African-American. And the uh, you know the NACP was a part of the Milligan versus uh, Merrill. It started out in Milligan versus Merrill case, and you know we demonstrated that the state of Alabama drew those lines intentionally to exclude African American, and it's called cracking and packing. You either uh, mm -hmm. disperse blacks so thin that they can't have any voting power or you pack them all into one district where they, if you were to separate them and put them in more than one district, they may be able to elect two is what we're happening here in Alabama. Or, you know, you, you pack them so that, you know, you know, they have um, 80, 70% of blacks in one district to assure that they are able to elect a black person. And so, if we don't get out and vote and elect people who uh, are like-minded, who want to do things fair, we're going to continue to get the same results over and over again where the elected officials are drawing our district lines uh, that do that not in the best interest of all its citizens. But I will tell you that the NLC, NACP and other organizations, you know, we watch this very closely and, and we are challenging it. And there are some more challenges that's coming up that I can't not, cannot talk about at this time. Mm -hmm. But we, I think you'll see some more challenges to some of the district lines that have been drawn uh, in the state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. If I could just add, add on to that, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, as, as Ms. Curry said, um, what, what gerrymandering allows is actually politicians to pick their voters as opposed to voters picking their politicians mm, mm, and mm. another effect adverse effect to, to to not only black people but to america of this gerrymandering is even in locations where they're packed as as mr simulton said when, where, where blacks are packed together even if they were dispersed it would allow a more moderate candidate to be competitive as opposed to extreme candidates where you have either basically a Black Panther in, in one district or a MAGA candidate in, in another district. There, there's no, and of course, I'm, that's hyperbole, but mm -hmm. there's no incentive for a moderate candidate to run, someone who listens to both sides and takes their interest into account. So uh, ultimately what has happened is the Supreme Court is allowing political gerrymandering and calling it legal. Mm -hmm. So um, it discourages people to vote because even when we do vote, <clears throat> our votes are either discounted or diluted due to the gerrymandering. And so I, you know, I, I thank you for bringing that up. I was going to kind of 
uh, deal with that a little bit later in terms, but you know, we can kind of go with it now. Um, you are an educator. You, you, you as pro right now, primarily you're teaching poli sci students and other students at Oakwood University. Uh, what do you say to them? And also, I, I'd like your input, Angela, in terms of what do you say to individuals, to the, the next generation who haven't been through the fight as, you know, um, their parents or their grandparents have, who see all of these things happening that systematically um, <laughs> are limiting the right to vote. And so, which seems to be a, uh, like a, uh, uh, um, I can't think of the word, but it's like one thing impacts the other, which continues to impact the right to vote, et cetera. And so uh, the question is, uh, what do you do? Um, what do you say to these individuals who say, I don't know if my vote even really matters. I don't know if it's worth going out there to vote. Um, well, again, there, there are a lot of things that we, we do to uh, make it tangible to our students that we are in a critical time and that, that voting is uh, a vital franchise. Uh, we just took uh, a busload of 50 students to the Legacy Museum in, in Montgomery. And so they could see the history and the purposefulness of uh, our white brothers and sisters who are opposed to our rights. And they could also see, our students could also see the bravery and the um, persistence of our Black heroes who fought over decades for our rights. We also point to um, some obvious things that, that seem to be already forgotten, like the insurrection and the purposefulness of those who are opposed to our rights. Um, because what we try to say, say to them is, if voting isn't important, why are our opponents trying, trying so hard to make sure that we don't vote? You can point to, uh, in the 2020 election, the fact that the Senate swung on the state of Georgia and the state of Georgia swung on the votes of Fulton County. And um, that was the difference between having a Republican Senate and a Democratic Senate. It's the difference between having Donald Trump as president or Joe Biden as president. And then finally, we, well not finally, but also one of the textbooks that we use in my state and local government class is the book, The Color of Law, where, you, where it is outlined over decades, how both state and local governments and the federal government has been complicit in um, denying full citizenship to black people in this country. So all of those things um, help make the case. Um, but finally, I'll say, I just asked them to turn on the television every day and see what is happening and what those who oppose us, I mean, I said, I, the last two things I'll say is, one, the um, governor of Florida and the Republican party are against diversity, equity, and inclusion. <laughs> I'm gonna say that again slowly. They are against diversity, equity and inclusion. And they're also against people being awake. So if that doesn't convince you, then I don't know if we can help you. And I'll yeah. piggyback off of what uh, Dr. Foster said in, when we uh, talk to individuals, we talk to student college students, we talk to homeschool students, we talk to adults as well. And what we find is that uh, even though people may show up to vote and then those who don't think their vote counts, they don't understand how the voting process impacts their day-to-day -day life. So we spend a lot of time providing um, what we call comprehensive American history. So, um, and if the young people uh, 
Gen Z did, was not aware of politics or they didn't want to be involved when the talking about banning TikTok began to take place. Oh, they were interested and wanted to know what was happening. So there is a tangible way to bridge the gap between voting as a tool and a, and a, uh, a as a powerful resource and how it impacts our day-to-day -day lives. When I speak to young people, I ask them to hold up their cell phones and I let them know that that's impacted by policies and processes based on legislation, even water bottles. I mean, there is so, there is nothing in our lives that's almost that's not touched by the government in some way, shape or form, whether we're subsidizing a service or it's being uh, regulated by laws. Uh, we also took a group of citizens to uh, the Legacy Museum. We took 39 people down there was a mixture of diversity, white, young, older, um, black. It we had a, a pretty mixed group because we believe that uh, once uh, everyone understands and connects the dots uh, about the way that our government has orchestrated our country to be a place that denies people's rights unless we uh, open our mouths and and, and advocate for democracy. I, I say all the time, America has never done right because it was right. It mm -hmm. has only done right when it has been uh, forced to or encouraged to by the voices of everyday citizens. Um, and so we have to, and if I find it interesting that, uh, I just call them the alt-right groups that are against minority groups of uh, people of color. They went from attacking critical race theory. They didn't see a tangible way to bring that into legislation. So then they began to talk about woke being woke. And then they landed on diversity, equity, and inclusion because they saw that there was a way to help uh, to, to come against that with legislation. And so if, like uh, Preston said, if people just turn on the TV, they will see that there's a reason that people are trying to take our right to vote because it does have value. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, um, as I'm listening to you, and I know that um, uh, uh, Bernard, uh, it, early on in the program, you kind of made the statement, uh, it's not just about the general election right now, but it's it's getting involved early in the process and, and trying to make the dots and, and turn on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just turning on the TV, but making the dots in terms of the real life implication. So you talk about young people, you talk about young ladies. And with the attack on um, the uh, abortion, now, whether you agree with abortion or not, um, but just the right to determine what you're able to do with your own bodies is an issue and that uh, that that doesn't just um lie with the general election in terms of the president but it trickles down to local elections state elections etc so bernard why is this so important i know everybody wants to you know every four years we we think about the general election but we don't think about local elections and the importance of voting there in our local right. districts, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. All politics are local. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the local elections, if you look at the turnout percentage, you know, 15%, you know, 20%, you know, is good for a local election. But that's where, and again, I, I'm not discounting the federal elections, but those local elections is where you can really see that your vote put this person in office or kept that person from getting into office. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not only about going to the polls and voting, it's about understanding the issues, you know, and I think Angela, you know, kind of referred to, you know, everything that we do somebody voted that you could do it you know from the uh 
streets that we drive on to the cars that we drive, you know, when the mission that they met and all that, that was voted on by somebody. Mm-hmm. And if you are, I want to be a part of this nation. If you want to be a part of your community, if you want to have an impact, then the way you can have the impact is to study those issues and share that knowledge with others and bring someone with you that may not want to, you know, they're not that excited about voting, but bring them with you so that they can see how important it is. Uh, this uh, election, uh, what, two weeks ago with uh, uh, the uh, 10th uh, State House District here in uh, Huntsville area, uh, I was talking to a young lady and she said she was just amazed at the number of times someone came by her house to say vote for you know uh, mm-hmm. a, a particular person. And so we've got to educate ourselves on the issues that are near and dear to us. And then we got to educate ourselves on the position that the different candidates are taking. And 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 Mary Land, she ran uh, ran and won on a very controversial issue here in the state of Alabama. Mm. And the reason she was able to win, she knocked on doors and talked to people and educated people on that particular issue and why that she needed to uh, needed their vote for that and to 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 be elected to office. And so that's that's why it's just so important that. Uh, all of our folks vote, our young folks, our elderly people, and uh, and those all in between get out and vote. And uh, it's yeah. your duty, it's your responsibility. If, if we recognize the connection between um, you know, as you as you all have shared, voting and your everyday life, the fact that I potentially have to drive five miles out of my way to go to a supermarket or to go to a particular place that has fresh produce, et cetera. And we have this idea of food deserts. It's because of um, you know, the fact that certain individuals were voted into office that had a particular agenda that were able to then um, uh, uh, move certain legislation that determined what part of town a supermarket was in or the library is closed in this place but not that place etc and so it's 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 the day-to-day things that we we're talking about that is all predicated on who you vote for and if you choose not to vote if you can if if you're not eligible to vote that's that's understandable and we'll talk about some things that we can do in terms of turning out the vote a little bit later in the program but if you um have the ability and the ed- eligibility to vote and you don't vote then how can you complain when things are not going your way um uh, you know, as a result of you not getting um, involved, uh, wh- how, how have you found this, uh, Preston, in in terms of talking with students from your perspective? It, it's really a challenge because um, you hear so much from people who are not connected politically or not curious politically that um, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. But in in fact, it makes all the difference in the world. The fact that we can be casual enough to think that it doesn't make a difference is is only possible because uh, of the freedoms that were won to allow us to vote. The simplest way I can explain it to, to, to students is, and you have to remember, many of these students literally grew up with Barack Obama as their as their president. Mm. So for mm. them, uh, it looks like everything is, is, is good. But when Barack Obama was elected in uh, tw- 2008, he actually won the states of North Carolina and Florida and Indiana mm. simply because Black people got out and voted. Um, and then he was reelected in 2012 again, fairly easily. But as a reaction to 
the knowledge that when black people vote, a black man can not only be elected, but reelected. Donald Trump is the kind of the antidote to that, uh, which causes um, poor white men who never voted before to vote. So it makes all the difference in the world who voted, who does not. In 2016, black people did not come out to vote like they did in 2008 and 2012. And we end up with Donald Trump placing three justices on the Supreme Court who are comfortable in, in denying our, our rights. When, when I say our, I'm talking about women, people of color, and poor people. So it makes all the difference in the world. It has made an immediate difference in everyone's life in America. Um, and um, the insurrection to me is the ultimate evidence that they do not want people to vote or they do not want to count these votes. They call the votes of black people in Fulton County and, and other places where it made a difference fraudulent. Hmm. The only thing that, that's fraudulent are the claims that the votes are fraudulent. They're just not used to black people voting and making the difference that, that, that we do. Black power is, is made real in the voting booth. And I think sometimes, and I tell my students this, I think that our white opponents understand this better than we do. Mm -hmm. mm. That's really uh, true. And when I say our white opponents, I'm talking about who opponents who oppose us, not all white people, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so Bernard, it, it, you know, with that, okay, so you're the president of the Alabama uh, uh, conference um, of the NAACP, and you talked a little bit about the work that the NAACP does. Does it get discouraging at times in terms of um, the ability to uh, you know, mitigate, mitigate against all this um, pointed, targeted, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, attacks against, you know, calculated attacks against uh, the voting uh, right. It, it certainly does, uh, Pastor. And, uh, but we get rejuvenated, we get re-energized when we go out there and can register one person or can change one person's attitude toward voting, can change one person's attitude toward democracy, and they can understand that, oh, this is what's at stake. This is why it's important to vote. And when you can go out and talk to folks and get them to understand that it's all worth it because we only we're going to change this process we're going to change this world through one person at a time one person one vote and yes we'd like to help thousand coming out saying you know hallelujah i found uh i i i see the light and i'm going to go out and vote if that happens that's great but you know we're going to this weekend we're going to go down to uh district two do some door knocking and and talk to the people and to get them to understand that, you know, uh, down in District 2, which is a new congressional district, you know, the turnout was around 22% for the primary election. You know, Blacks cannot win that district with that kind of turnout. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to educate the people, we've got to motivate them, and we've got to get them to the polls. Uh, certainly, in, in, uh, in, there's a primary runoff this uh, next Tuesday, but we got to make sure that they are motivated and ready to go to the polls in November. Otherwise, all this effort that we have done to create a, another district where blacks can elect a person of their choice would have been in vain. And uh, but, you know, we're not going to stop. We're going to continue to fight. You know, it's just two men of our four parents have, have given all that they had for this. And I know a lot of our young folks don't appreciate, you know, 
uh, Dr. King, when you start talking to them about Dr. King effort, oh, I, you know, I, I get tired of hearing about Dr. King. Mm. And I, I get that and I understand. But, you know, that's why it's important for us to continue to continue the education process, to not let them ever forget their past. Because if they forget their past, then, you know, the future is, is not promised to them because it was subject to repeat itself. And we are seeing that right now with some of these bills being passed right here in the state of Alabama, you know, and 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 I don't want to get ahead of it, but, you know, the, uh, the SB1 where absentee ballot, you know, you, you cannot help a person with their absentee ballot if you're not their next of kin. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing that I've heard, ever heard. Mm. And the state saying, well, we want to prevent ballot harvesting. There is no ballot harvesting in the state of Alabama. And they are passing a bill that's uh, that for a solution, I mean, for a problem that does not exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So listen, I want to take a quick break. Um, and then when we come back, um, and, and I know you've started, uh, Bernard, but I want to get from, from everybody your perspective in terms of where do we go from here? We recognize the issue. We recognize where we are right now. But where do we go from here in terms of either making a change or fighting for a change? So we'll be right back um, after this break. <music> For those of you just joining us, we are uh, talking about the current attacks against uh, voter registration, voting rights, etc. And so we uh, we want to look now in in terms of what can we do. We know the problems are great. We know the issues are complex. We know there is there are targeted, um, calculated attacks against limiting. Um, the number of people who can vote, the number of people who are eligible to vote, um, where they can vote, when they can vote, how they can vote. What can we do uh, within our different spheres, within, you know, as uh, from a personal perspective, from a church perspective, from a community perspective, what can we do to, um, uh, uh, to keep, to, to protect, the right to vote. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to ask each of you to kind of answer from your perspective. Is there one that you want to start with or just? Oh, no, any, any. just, just, okay. just. <laughs> okay. I, I will uh, kind of continue where I left off. And uh, what can we do? Um, and it's not what can we do, it's what we must do because if we're going to save our democracy, then we must uh, get out and vote. We must educate our people on the issues that are before us, not only those big issues that we see, you know, but a lot of the little small issues in our small towns that are affecting the way we live. You know, we get <clears throat> calls all the time about uh, uh, someone environmental issue, whether it's their sewage, uh, whether it's their drainage in their community. They've been living in this community for several years, you know, 30, 40 years. And it's a constant battle when it rains, their, 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 their uh, toilets and everything flood. And the city is not doing anything about it. The county is not doing anything about it. And you go down to my street, you go down my road, the roads are horrible. The roads are terrible. You know, street lights don't work. And we've got to change that by going to the polls and elect people that's going to use your tax dollars that you're paying to put, invest in your community. Our senators, our uh, congressmen that goes to Washington, D.C., that money comes back to Alabama. And it does not come into our community at any large rate. Yeah, we get, you know, uh, maybe a million dollars here, a million dollars over there. But the need is so great that we should be, unless that money is, is, is earmarked for a particular city or community, that those funds uh, go to the state and then the state will decide how to uh, divide those funds up and will not go for the purpose in which our leaders, uh, uh, some of our people in Congress 
you know, fault for those dollars to come because when they come to the state, the state can somewhat decide where to spend those dollars and they are not spending them in our community where it's needed so much. And I will say, um, so United Women of Color uses a holistic approach in the things that we do um, to engage voters and to engage residents. Because we tell people, even if you never cast a ballot, you still can be civically engaged. Because mm -hmm. casting a ballot is one slice of the civic engagement pie. So then we provide uh, learning opportunities for people to, um, so that I'm not the only expert, but we have volunteers who um, teach and empower other individuals to go out and educate their families. We connect the dots with how legislation affects our day-to-day -day life and what we can do to influence uh, those changes and be at the table when decisions are being made or questions are being asked. Another thing, we do civic engagement book clubs. So we take the books of those who've come before us uh, to lay the foundation for why we need to be involved and, and look at the different ways in which, because we are not as a people of color, a monolith. So look at the different ways in which individuals, ordinary women, ordinary uh, men who were involved in, in what impact they made. We also realize that people who live in poverty they don't have the luxury of necessarily being as civically engaged as, as I am. And so we provide uh, economic advancement opportunities because when you make more money, you have health insurance, you have benefits, uh, you, have the, you have more freedom of time. And so you have opportunity to get more involved. And the lastly, we uh, want people to not only uh, vote, we want people to consider running for office uh, because there are a lot, when we look at women and, and leadership, women in, in where we live make up 52% of our population, but we do not make up the majority of the legislative uh, representatives in our area. So when we uh, elect people who think like we do, we can expect to have them to create policies that include us. So. Mm -hmm. And and from the classroom, we're we're trying to, yeah. From the classroom, we're trying to do some things that engage our students directly. For example, at Oakwood University, we founded uh, an organization called United Collegiate Black Scholars, and the um, the mission of UCBS is to basically be a convener for um, the HBCUs, for student leaders in each HBCU to come together to, um, to chart out the political agenda of young Black Americans, to prioritize the, the political agenda of young Black Americans, because they see our agenda being, um, being assembled by boomers and people even older than me. Once they are directly involved, then they will be, be motivated to move on this. Another thing I think we need to do is that we need to be more creative in how we, um, we I'll put it simply, we need to give young people something to vote for. Um, mm -hmm. We need to, to put referenda and get referenda on the ballot, you notice that in states, even red states or pro-choice states, when they put abortion on the ballot, abortion rights won. Mm -hmm. And if, if abortion rights wins, that means that more progressive people are coming out to vote. We need to give them people, give them something to vote for. The other day in class, I was telling my students about the Equal Rights Amendment how something called the Equal Rights Amendment did not pass in the United States of America. And they could not fathom how a politician could remain viable while saying that they are against equal rights for women. Mm -hmm. I think we need to put that back on, on the ballot. We need to 
to make politicians take a stand on issues that should be embarrassing for them to, to stand against. We have to play hardball. And when I say hardball, we need to put tough choices in front of the American people and point to politicians and, and say, let me understand this. You're against equal rights for women? Did I understand that correctly? <laughs> and, and if you do that, they will either moderate their position or if they don't, it will draw out people who cannot fathom that they, they have a senator who's against the equal rights for women. In short, we need more political partners and we need to be creative in how we create those partnerships. I, um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. And I go back to it as Bernard, as you said, all politics is local. It begins with your local, you know, city, um, county, wherever you are. Show up to meetings. Uh, um, um, question candidates. Go to, you know, candidate forums where, um, you know, a candidate is talking. Ask the questions, uh, you know, put before them, what is your position on X, Y, and Z? Um, in, in, you know, um, in local forums or local meetings, explain the impact of a particular, of a potential uh, decision, what it will have either on the community or a particular group, um, the uh, maybe unintended consequences, but just sitting and doing nothing, watching the news, getting frustrated by the news and the hyperbole and, and just the the the, um, the the you know the information you know being and the lies and and manipulation and the the indoctrination coming from uh, politicians and then just throwing up your hands and turning off the TV um, that's not going to help. But as as individuals, as communities, as churches, even though we have this idea of you know guarding you know the separation between church and state, but you, we can still provide a platform for individuals to um, state what they're going to do and defend their record, et cetera. Uh, and, and in these ways, we can try to make a difference, not only in protecting the right to vote, but in ensuring that we break the cycle. Because if we don't, then the same individuals who are trying to limit who votes and how they mm -hmm. vote will get their candidates into office who will continue to uh, draft legislation that make it even harder for um, contrary opinions to be heard and contrary views to be uh, shared, et cetera. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I know that, um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm no, sorry, you were... Pastor. I, I just wanted to give one other example. Yeah, please. Yeah, I wanted to give one other example of an idea that one of our students had that would engage them. Mm -hmm. uh, about two weeks ago, Alabama defunded diversity, equity, and inclusion for all Alabama state officers. And um, one of my students thought, well, the people in Alabama care a lot about college football. <laughs> and what if we students targeted student athletes who were thinking about coming to Alabama to play football and said, I don't think you want to come here because this state is against diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you can mobilize young people on an issue like that, it can make the people of Alabama change their minds on DEI mm -hmm. if their football team starts losing. Yeah. And yeah. I know that seems trivial, but it's in, that's how things happen in Alabama. Um, uh, those of us who are old enough, and I guess that's only me, we might remember uh, a, a football player from the University of Southern California named Sam Cunningham, who scored six touchdowns against the Alabama football team in 1972 when it was still a segregated football team. Um, that was the last time Alabama fielded an all-white football team mm. because it's that important. 
Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, go, go ahead. Yeah. Now, and, and, I and, wanted to add. I'm sorry. I had another one to add. <laughs> Just the power of collective uh, advocacy. Five minutes collectively adds up. So just making phone calls or sending a text for five to different people for five minutes makes a huge impact when 20 or 30 people do that. And statistics say on average that local officials, if they receive 30 emails or phone calls or a combination of both, that will sway, typically sway their uh, opinions or their decision making. So it's not a large number. We think of thousands and on petitions and things like that. It's just actually two or three dozen people, one Bible study class, one Sunday school, one set, uh, uh, study group can call, can make a difference in, in an impact in legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and just one thing I wanted to add to that is <clears throat> we become too reactive rather than proactive. And what I mean by that is uh, mm -hmm. when something happens in our community, we rally the troops and we get everybody to come out and you know say, this is wrong, this is wrong. This needs to be happening uh, every day at every city council meeting, at every uh, county commission meeting. We need to be there telling them what we want and telling the police chief how, <clears throat> how we want him to uh, treat our, him or her, how we want him to uh, want them to treat our citizen so that, you know, we're not just reacting when something happens in our community. And I, I just want to finish with, you know, America is becoming so divided. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember when uh, Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House and he could galvanize people on both sides of the House. But right now, you know, we get into our own political uh, uh, kingdoms and we will not, we can't cross that line because if you're a Democrat, you know, if you want the support of the other Democrats, then you got to support that. And, and of course, the Republicans, you know, this is the way it's going to be or else we're not going to support you. And we, of course, saw that and see that with the Speaker of the House uh, currently at the way, it's, way, way things are going. And so we need to, uh, again, become more uh, proactive than reactive. And America needs to wake up and stop being so uh, uh, divided. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. We'll be right back after this. I want to thank everybody for, for joining us, and I'll be back with a word right after this. Again, I want to thank our guests, uh, Bernard Similton, uh, Angela Curry, and Preston Foster for their uh, uh, expertise and for helping us with this, this topic and this issue. Uh, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, uh, those of you who are here. Um, maybe it, you are not registered to vote, and maybe it's too late for you to register to vote but you are able to um, bring somebody to the polls you are, who is eligible to vote. You are able to, to do those things, to, to um, get involved in local organizations, whether it's United Women of Color, whether it's the N a local chapter of the NAACP, uh, wh whoever or, or whatever it may be, there is something that you can do that in some small way can help to not only advocate um, and uh, uh, for the right to vote, uh, but also protect the right to vote. I want to thank you for joining us. I want to invite you to join us uh, next month, uh, May the 9th. We will be dealing with the topic of um, education, the changing landscape of education. And... Uh, 
looking specifically at non-traditional education. And so we'll, that'll be uh, Thursday, May the 9th at 7 p.m. I look forward to um, you joining us. I want to thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time on The Public Square.